Our vision statement for 2023, connect to God, connect with people, and then share hope. 1 Peter 3.15, the apostle said, if anyone asks about the hope living within you, always be ready to explain your faith. So to share your hope and explain your faith is one of God's purposes for your life. To share your hope and then explain your faith. This is a kingdom key. It is the expression of your hope that opens the door to the explanation of your faith. If we're hopeful, people will ask us why. And you can share your faith. Now, in part one of this message, I gave you three things. Hope pulling the trigger of life. What of hope? What of it? Why is it so important? And then number two, a hopeless world. Why the need for hope? And then number three, loaning your hope. How to restore hope in people. We did this because hope is a social gift. It's the results of interaction and relationship with people. That's why church is not antiquated. Let me say that again. Congregational worship is not antiquated. It's not old fashioned. Tradition is the living faith of dead men. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living men. We're not talking about traditionalism. We're talking about tradition. Church is not antiquated. You still need the church. You need to come and gather with the saints and experience corporate worship and come underneath the preaching of God's word and then have an opportunity in the altar to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. I still believe in the church. I don't care how old fashioned they say it is. I believe that Jesus died for the church. Believe in the church. It's a social gift and you get it by rubbing shoulders with people of hope. One Latin meaning of hope is breathe or breath to give oxygen to someone. And hope is oxygen to the human soul. And there are those souls that need your breath of hope to breathe on them. Hope. To share your hope until they find their own. Today's message. Share hope, One City Church Vision 2023, part two. Father, bless the reading of your word. We pray this in Christ's name and the church said amen. Amen. Two things to share with you this morning. First of all, the heirs of salvation. This is the who of hope. Last week we talked about what of hope, why of hope, and how of hope, but now the who of hope. Titus chapter 3 verse 7, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You have to understand and remember that this hope we share is an eternal hope. It's the only thing that lasts, this hope. And we share it as heirs of salvation. The word heirs here in the Greek means one who receives his allotted possession by right of sonship. I'm an heir through Christ Jesus. And there's an allotment. There's an inheritance set aside for me. It's mine. Sonship. That's why I'm always encouraging you. Live up to the standard that God wants for you. Live your life to the fullest. Don't waste it. It's something that's very, that's very precious. I have the hope of eternity, but I have hope here and now. I look to the kingdom of heaven, but I look to the kingdom of God here and now. I want to live my life and I want to make a difference. So live your life, sons of God. The word legacy comes from a, uh, a, a Latin word uh, meaning ambassador, uh, a, a deputy, an envoy. Legacy. It, it means to appoint a spokesperson for the future. 
A legacy. When, when you speak of legacy, you, you have to realize that you're, you're speaking about appointing someone to speak in the future, to speak perhaps of who you were and what you did. Legacy. You see, Ecclesiastes 3, he said, he, he has also set eternity and the human heart. We've mentioned this many times that uh, we have this sense of eternity. We in, intuitive, we know that we're going to live forever. And so because of this sense of eternity, uh, it creates within mankind the need to leave a legacy, to leave something behind. The problem is we, we spend our time with the wrong things. You see, uh, man's attempt at leaving a legacy is done with like creating a business or writing a book or building a building or a monument and so forth. Now, there's nothing wrong with these things as long as they take you to the next step of legacy or leaving an ambassador that will speak in the future. People. Writing a book is a good thing, but books can burn. What matters is how does that book impact somebody's life that now becomes your legacy or your ambassador that speaks for you in the future. That's what's important, that you invest in people. So know this, your real legacy is not the things that are temporal that you have left behind you, but the heirs eternal that you take with you. It's not the monument that you leave behind you. It's the heirs that you take with you. That's what's important. I hope that my children and my grandchildren and parishioners and people that I've impacted in my life, I hope after I'm dead and gone, perhaps the greatest compliment they could pay me, the greatest thing that could happen for me is someone to say, Pastor Felshaw, my dad, my granddad taught me this. And they begin to live that out. Heirs, legacy, ambassadors that represent the truth that I instilled in them. That's the real legacy of a man or a woman. Not only the people you take to heaven, but the people you leave on earth that continue with this gospel message. So build the buildings, write the books, but most importantly, let us invest in people. That's what a legacy is. It means to appoint a spokesperson for the future, that deputy, that ambassador that will represent the truth that you instill in them. Proverbs eleven thirty. but a life lived loving God bears lasting fruit for the one who is truly wise wins souls. Again, we're willing souls, the heirs of salvation. We said here last Sunday, there are three components of true ministry. The first one was value people. If you value people, you will invest in them. Secondly, believe in people. If you believe in people, they will rise to that belief. And number three, love people unconditionally. If you love people unconditionally, you will accept them without conditions. No matter their color, their social status, their economic status, their gender, you'll just accept them without condition. If we value people, we believe in people, and we love people unconditionally, we can then truly minister to people. Have to. That's how we do it. But let me talk to you about valuing people, to, to find value in a soul, because that's what we're talking about, the heirs of salvation, the who of hope, the who of hope, heirs of salvation, finding value. You need to know this. The greatest treasure in heaven is a soul. It's not the streets of gold, the pearly gates. It's souls. John chapter 3, 16. For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. I've said to this many times. When it comes to souls, God can't help himself. He gave his best. He gave his all. You need to know too that the greatest treasure in hell is a soul. 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil roams around incessantly, obsessively, like a roaring lion looking for its prey to devour. When it comes to souls, Satan can't help himself. He is obsessive about destroying people's lives that have a spirit that can connect to the Heavenly Father. 
That's what he's after. He don't care about your car. I know you think he, I know he's not, he's not trying, he's not after your wash machine. The wash machine breaks down and we go, the devil did that. That thing's 25 years old. That the devil broke that thing. Look, he's after your testimony. He's after your spirit. He's after your connection to the Father. He wants to destroy that. And he is obsessive when it comes to souls. The greatest treasure on earth is a soul. Matthew 16, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Think about that. When it comes to souls, God can't help himself. When it comes to souls, Satan can't help himself. When it comes to souls, man is willing to barter. Wow. Wow. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he barters off his soul? Or what will he give in exchange for his soul? The word profit means to be useful or advantageous. It's an advantage to him. Exchange means that which is given in place of another or ransom. We look for things that are useful, that give us an advantage. How would this best serve me? How would this best meet my need? And so oftentimes, if we don't find profit in people, we ransom them for something else. We exchange. When it comes to souls, God can't help himself. When it comes to souls, Satan is obsessive. But when it comes to souls, man seems to be willing to barter. We're willing to. But see, this is why this is so important, this one statement. If we value people as eternal, we will view them as priceless. That's why I started out talking about the heirs of salvation of the eternal hope. How that the word legacy comes from a Latin word, the meaning, it speaks about a, a spokesperson, a deputy, an ambassador that goes into the future and speaks. That's why I, I, I mentioned it's not the buildings and the monuments and the books we write that is truly our legacy. It's those people that we invest in. That's our true legacy. It's those people that we invest in. The heirs of salvation that have that eternal hope that we give to them, that we share with them, that we loan them, that we invest in them. That's what really matters. You see, if we value people as eternal, then we won't barter them. And we're willing to make an investment. And we see them as priceless. So this takes me to my message. What I really want to leave with you today, and that is understanding lifestyle evangelism. We understand the who of hope. What is it we're doing? We're, we're trying to reach people, the heirs of salvation, those that we want to reach and, and invest in. Now I want to talk to you about what then of hope? What, what, what then? What do I do now? What is it you want me to do, pastor? Mark 16 it said, and he said to them, as you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful news of the gospel to the entire human race. Notice that as you go, preach openly good news. You see, lifestyle evangelism is simply living out loud the goodness of God in your life. That's all that is. That's all that is. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to go to school. You, don't have, you just need to know this. That lifestyle evangelism is simply wherever you go. It's just in the going. Going to Walmart, to Kroger, to work, to school, wherever you go. He said, just live out loud. Live out loud the goodness that God has bestowed upon you. Let your hope express itself. Let your life just Live out loud. Share your hope so you'll have an opportunity to explain your faith. Just smile. 
Be kind to people. Be good to people. Help people. Just reach out to people. I was telling the family again a story the other day. It happened to me back in Pensacola. It was raining one day and I had to go to the grocery store and I ran in and got my stuff and I came out. And how many of you stand at the door and you try to first find your car, <laughs> you calculate how long it's going to take, how wet you're going to get, and if you really want to wait or go for it. I mean, am I the only one that does that? So I'm standing and I'm calculating. I said, okay, there it is. Okay, I'm going around that puddle right there and I'll shoot straight there and I'll go on that side and I'll get in. Here we go. I take off. And about halfway there, I hear this little voice faintly saying, help. <laughs> so I stop and I look and over to my right, there's a van, the side door is open and there's a man with the lift that comes down in a wheelchair on his back and he can't ride himself. He was trying to get up that ramp, you know, to put some in, and because he, he drives himself, he's got the sticks and everything, and he, oh, somehow in a way he must have slipped and fell back on that, in that wheelchair, and he's laying there in the rain with he can't get up, and and I hear him saying help, and I'm in the rain. <laughs> now I've got to be honest with you, for just a second I'm debating. Now, I know you're righteous and you're more holy than I am, and you would never do that. But just for a moment, I'm debating. But of course, I knew I couldn't leave him. And so I went over there and I helped the brother up and got him on his round. He got up and got in the van. And I sent him on his way. Help. Just that brief moment of just helping people. Lifestyle evangelism is simply just going and doing life and living out loud of the goodness of God, demonstrating the goodness of God, showing mercy, being kind, helping a brother, reaching out to people. That's what lifestyle evangelism is. You don't have a degree. You don't, you don't always maybe say it perfect or do it just right or have all your theology in a row. Lifestyle evangelism is just simply living out loud the goodness of God. So there are three words I want to give you that I want you to take home with you today that will describe who you are as lifestyle evangelists that are going after the heirs of salvation, not just building buildings and starting businesses and writing books and building monuments, but we're going after the heirs of salvation. We want those people, okay? So number one, you are a witness to the goodness of God. Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses. The word witness here, of course, it does speak of a martyr, but it also is a word that's used in a legal sense. So I want you to know this. God did not say you will be my attorney. Attorneys argue a case and press for a decision. He said, you'll be my witnesses which testify to what they saw and or experienced. That's all you're going to do. You say, but I'm not a pastor. I'm not a minister. I'm not qualified. I'm not educated. I don't have all the theology. I don't know Romans road to salvation. I don't have it memorized. It's okay. All you got to do is live out loud the goodness of God that's in your life. All you got to do is be a witness. I, I don't need you to, to state a case or, or, or argue a, a point. I, God don't need you to do that. God needs you to be a witness. Just a witness. I, I, let, let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I experienced. Let me tell you what God did in my life. Let me tell you how God touched my life. Listen, guys. People want to belong, and then they're going to believe, okay? They want you to pull them in to your testimony, they want you to pull them into relationship. We'll work out the theology later. We'll get there. We'll get there. But up front, they just need you to witness of his goodness. To witness of his kindness and his mercy. To share the love of God that's been poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. He said, you will be my witnesses. 
John 15, when the advocate comes, Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. He's talking about this advocate, parakletos. This means one who pleads another's case before a judge, counsel for defense. In the courtroom, let us testify of God's goodness and let the Holy Spirit press for our decision or conviction. Parakletos, he's the advocate that comes before the judge, the counsel for defense. So here's my point. All I have to do, preach the gospel, give the altar call, and let Holy Spirit press the decision and bring conviction. See, you're carrying way too much responsibility. What happens if I give an altar call and nobody comes? What happens if you give an altar call and they do? What happens if I share my testimony with somebody and they don't respond? What if they do? It's your responsibility to witness. It's Holy Spirit's responsibility to bring a conviction. (laughs) Guys, I'm trying to help you up in here. Because Christians don't witness. Because we're afraid to. What if I do it wrong? What if I don't have all the theology right? What happens if they don't respond? Leave the response to Holy Spirit. You're called to be a witness in the courtroom. You witness, let Holy Spirit press the decision. You're a witness. Number two, you are an apprentice in training. I'm not saying you're an expert, you're an apprentice in training. Matthew 4, then he said to them, the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Notice that two things, follow me, fishers of men. Follow me, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. Make you, make you. So number one, if you're not fishing, then you're not truly following. And notice it's called fishing, not getting. You fish, you witness Let Holy Spirit press the decision. Conviction. Let him do that. That takes that responsibility off of you. Where you have this freedom now just to witness and just to share my testimony. And I believe Holy Spirit's going to honor that. And he's going to bring conviction. Number two, he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You learn by doing. Guys, you learn by doing. He said, wherever you go. Just share the good news. It's in the going. It's in the living life. It's in the daily routine. That's the harvest field. Paying attention to those around you. And understanding that if I'm not fishing, then I'm really not truly following him. Because he is a fisherman. And so... We have to ask the question, am I impacting people's lives? Am I making a difference in people? You've got to see this. And you go, he's going to make you a fisherman as you go. George Gallup did a survey that said in America, there are 34 million people who said, I would go to church if somebody would invite me. Wow. 34 million. I've got a few empty chairs. I'll be glad to fill them up. All you got to do is say to somebody, Would you like to come to church with me? They're just waiting for somebody to invite them. That's it. Just to reach out. 95% of Christians have never won a soul to Christ. I didn't say it. They did. 95% of Christians have never seen someone get saved. Never. Why Christians don't witness? Lack of qualification. Lack of training, they say. Lack of confidence, lack of speaking skill, or I don't have the personality for that. Lack of concern for the lost because we get busy and or fear of man. They might reject me. They might laugh at me. They may think I'm a quack, a kook. I'm crazy. Fear of man. So how do you get started? I know you think, oh, pastor doesn't have a problem with this. No, listen, we're all the same. All the same. All the same. I remember, um, I remember one day we were at Logan's one night eating dinner. Suzanne and I, and, and this was back when Adam 
and Liz Panapento was here. And I was sitting at the head of the table, not because I'm important, but because I like to turn sideways and spread out. And so I'm sitting at the head of the table and the waitress comes walking around that table and she comes walking around. Immediately I, I felt the presence of God and he said to me, tell her that everything's going to be okay. And she started taking orders and I let that moment pass. The next Sunday, I mentioned that to you guys and Adam after service said, pastor, I'm going to tell you, I had the same exact word. Two men, same table. We both, both missed it because just fear of man. But all I had to do, I didn't have to give her, I didn't have to give her some theological discourse. All I had to do was look at her and say, sis, come here. I want you to listen to me. God spoke to me. Holy Spirit nudged me. He wants me to tell you it's going to be okay. Who knows what that would have opened up to me. But you see, it's the fear of man. So how do you get started? Start with people's felt need, then move to their real need. Had I done that with that girl, she may have broke down weeping with me and said, you know, my husband just left me and I'm all alone. And I could have said, no, you're not. I know somebody that will go through that with you. And who knows? Because I dealt with her felt need that led me to her real need. You see, there's only one way to the father. Jesus said, I am the way. No man can get to the father but through me, right? There's only one way to the father, but there are many reasons men come to Christ. In the, Old Testament, excuse me, in the New Testament, some came because they were hungry. Some came because they were naked and, and needed clothing. Some came with questions. Some people came to debate. Some people came because they needed to be healed. Some, there are many reasons people come to Christ. There may be one way to the Father, but there are many reasons and many ways that people find their way to Christ. So if you meet people at their point of need, you will discover the key that will unlock the door to their heart. You may start out with a blanket or a coat on a cold day. You may start out with praying with somebody that needs healing in their body. You may start out with just giving them an encouraging word. You may start out with just giving them $20 to buy a meal. But the point is, if you start with their felt need, it will lead you to their real need. And it will open the door to you. So you have to understand that you're an apprentice in training. Number one, you're a witness. Not to argue the case, but to testify to what you saw and what you've experienced. And then number two, you don't have to be an expert. You're just an apprentice in training. He said, I will make you fishers of men. Number three, you're an ambassador of God's kingdom. Second Corinthians 5. We are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The word ambassador here, of course, means accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. America has an ambassador to England. England has an ambassador to America. This is a person who acts as a representative or promoter of a specified activity. You can be an ambassador for a nonprofit organization and you're promoting something specific, maybe a project or an event. I'm an ambassador of this event and you're promoting that specific activity. Ambassador. Second Corinthians 5.18, Paul said, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's amazing. Hmm. And that word committed there in the Greek, just side note, it means a divine appointment. God's given you a divine appointment. He's given you an appointment. He's given you a word of reconciliation. And, and there are appointments in your future if you'll pay attention. So let me talk to the ambassadors in the room. Here are your credentials. You're accredited diplomat with designated authority. You have authority. As the ambassador of America to England has authority and the ambassador of England to America has authority. You have an authority. You're a diplomat of the kingdom of God. You have authority. You need to know that. 
Number two, you're a promoter of a specified activity, that reconciliation. You're promoting this event of reconciliation. You have an assignment. God's given you an assignment to reconcile fallen man with Holy Father. That's why last week I gave you the acrostic share. The, the letter S means share with them what God said about them. You're trying to reconcile them with their father. You have an assignment. Number three, you're a representative with the word of reconciliation or listen to me, there's an anointing on your life. There's an anointing. You have authority, you have an assignment, and you have, a, you have an anointing. There's authority, I can speak for him. I have an assignment to reconcile fallen man. And there's an anointing that comes on me when I do that. I've been in places before and been talking to people, just talking to them and, and, and suddenly you just begin to get deep inside and you begin to just open up and that river begins to flow. And I feel the anointing come all over me as I'm sharing with somebody a word that God's given me. And there's an authority that rises up. You've got to know that. I'm trying to speak to the fear that we have to witness. You have authority, you have an assignment, and you have an anointing. You got to sense that. You got to grab this, guys. The devil has lied to us. He's intimidated us. He has pushed us in the shadows. And I'm telling you, you're an ambassador of Christ. That means there's an authority that you have. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you have an assignment. It's to reach out to the heirs of salvation. That's your legacy. Not the monument, not the plaque. It's the heirs of salvation. And you have an anointing. If you open your mouth and witness, testify of what you saw, what you experienced, I promise you the anointing will flow. It will happen. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. Okay, you see that? So look at this. On the screen. Kingdom authority, obedience to the assignment, anointed word equals the power of salvation. Amen. You just do that. If I will walk in my authority, if I will accept my assignment, and if I will trust the anointing, I'm telling you, he's given you an anointed word, the word of reconciliation. If you'll just share that word with people, you'll see the power of salvation. I've done this for, since I was 15 years old. I've stood in pulpits across America and overseas. And I've stood and preached the gospel and then come to the end of it and give an altar call. And I've watched as Holy Spirit fell on that crowd and pull on the heartstrings of people. And people get up and come to the altar with tears running down their face as they give their heart to the Lord. It astounds me how this works. Through the foolish, foolishness of preaching, he chose to save men. You sit there and I holler at you for 40 minutes. I watch myself on Fox 4 Sunday morning, 7.30. And many times I turn off and say, my God, I'm going to quit preaching. <laughs> and yet people still get saved. In spite of us. Ain't that good? Ain't that amazing? There's a dynamic here I'm trying to get you to grasp. That there's an authority in this moment. That there's an assignment in this moment. And there's an anointing in this moment that equals the power of salvation. And as here, so in Starbucks, Kroger, Walmart, you can walk into a marketplace with an authority on you that I'm here to push back the darkness. You can walk in there with an assignment. I'm trolling, I'm looking, I'm fishing. Fishing, not getting some days you catch, some days you don't, but you're always fishing. You're trying is what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying as an apprentice, as a witness, I'm trying. You're fishing, you're fishing. You're looking for opportunity. You're looking, you're paying attention. You're watching for windows. You're watching for open door. You're looking, you're paying attention. And in that moment, 
When you step into your authority, out of your fear, step into your delegated, designated authority. Heaven has designated authority to me to step into my assignment of reconciliation. Suddenly the anointing on that word of reconciliation begins to flow and it equals the power of salvation. As with Stephen, the martyr in Acts 7, when you take a stand for Christ, heaven will stand up for you. The Bible says that Stephen was standing there and they gathered around him, they're stoning him. And he says he looked up to heaven and he said, look, the son of man standing at the right hand of the father. Because Stephen took a stand for Christ, my God, Christ stood up for him. I want to tell you something, guys. I tell you, my God, for Jesus Christ to stand up, when a dignitary walks into the room, we stand up. When a guest speaker comes to this pulpit, we stand up. We show honor to people. We respect people. We stand up. We do that in the South. We still do it some. Some of us do stand up when a lady walks in the room. Just, you You stand up, dignity, respect. But Stephen was standing there taking a stand for Christ and it was going to cost him his life. He took a stand, but Jesus stood up for him. That's like God saying, Abraham is my friend. Oh my Lord. We look for the accolades of men, plaques and monuments and buildings named after us. I'd rather have God tell me I'm his friend. I'd rather have Jesus stand up for me when I take a stand for him. My God. He was witnessing about Christ and they wanted to kill him. But Jesus stood up for him. So in closing, David, come help me. So I want you to understand. The who of this thing is the heirs of salvation. We're going for them. They're the who. Who's this for? It's for the heirs of salvation. That's our real legacy. It's not buildings and books. It's people that the book impacts. The investment made in them. That's our legacy. And then number two... I just want to encourage you that you don't have to be an attorney. All you gotta do is witness, testify in the court. Like the guy said, I got healed. The Pharisees came to challenge him. He said, I really don't know about all the theology, protocol, but I know where I was blind, now I see. All you gotta do is witness. Let me tell you what he did for me. And then number two, you're an apprentice. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be. You learn as you go. And then number three, I just, I want you to feel the weightiness of this moment. And I don't feel like I'm doing this sermon justice. Somebody else needs to take this thing and go preach it. But you're an ambassador. I'm a representative. I'm a representative of heaven. I have delegated, designated authority. Heaven stands behind me. So I can step into a moment with authority, with confidence. Okay, if I take a stand for Christ, Christ is going to stand up for me. I'm going to do this. I've got authority. And I know what I'm doing. I've got this assignment. It's just simply to reconcile fallen sons with Holy Father. And I know when I start talking, there's an anointing going to come. My words might not be eloquent, 
the verbiage may not be just right. I'm probably going to mess this up. But there's an anointing that's going to come. And those three things together equals the power of salvation. As I mentioned earlier, I preach many messages. Most messages, I walk away from here and I tell Suzanne, that was a mess. But when I get up to preach and I start preaching, and then I give an altar call and people come down and get saved, I'm going, wow. Really? Out of that mess? See, it's not about me. It's not about how eloquent I am. It's about you trying from a sincere heart. You're trying and you're preaching his word. The delivery may not be just right, but you're trying. An apprentice in training. And I'll be an apprentice in training till the day I die. about Holy Spirit I witness he presses a conviction <laughs> God. and they get saved in heaven's court think about that so know this that there is a corporate anointing Acts 2 the early church they continued to meet together in the temple courts they went to church and they broke bread in their small group. In homes. Now while they went to church and even in the small groups, they were praising God and worshiping and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Do you see that? Yes. Worshiping among the people, finding hope, people were getting saved. Studies show that people come to Christ quicker in the context of a large setting or group than they do just one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one. One -on -one is critical, but more people get saved in a group. Studies show that more people get saved in a, in a, in a group of people as opposed to just one-on-one. -on -one. The corporate witness of believers adds credibility to your testimony. You see, whenever you talk to people about Christ and they come to church and they look around, they see there's other people in here. Oh, well, they're, they're, they're worshiping. Uh, they're lifting their hands. Uh, they, they're weeping or they're dancing. Uh, it, it leads credibility to your witness or your testimony. You're not as kooky as they thought you were. Because there's other people just as crazy as you are. Are, 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 are you connecting with this? As people sit in a small group and they're going around the circle and people are sharing their, their heart and sharing their faith or sharing their hope or sharing their insight or telling their story, suddenly they're, they're hearing something common that these men have encountered the same Christ that you encountered and it lets credibility to your testimony. There's a corporate anointing. It's important that you bring people to church. 35 million, 34 million people say, if you'll just invite me, I'll come. And when they come, we'll worship. They'll find the favor, the acceptance, the hospitality of the people. And then the Lord will add to the church daily those that should be saved. It's a New Testament formula if we'll just follow it. So today's takeaway. Number one, the heirs of salvation, they're the who of the hope. That's why we do what we do. If we value people as eternal, we will view them as priceless. And we won't change, exchange them for something else. Number two, lifestyle evangelism. The what then of hope. What do I do now? Well, you're a witness, you're an apprentice, and you're ambassador of God's kingdom. That's what you do. So, to share your hope and explain your faith, that's one of God's purposes for your life. To take a bracelet and to go out into the community. And when you run into the hopeless, take this off your wrist. Quote that scripture to them, Romans 15, 13, and say to them, the God of hope 
fill you with all joy. I want you to know tomorrow's going to be a better day. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to loan you my hope until you find your own.